What's up, family? Thanks so much for joining us for our worship experience. We're so glad that you're part of our community today. Listen, here at Impact Church, we believe one person can impact many. So take a moment, start a watch party, hit like, subscribe, share, help us get the word out. And again, thanks so much for joining us and enjoy the word this morning. Well, this morning, are you guys ready to jump into the word? All right, well, we're bringing forth the word. It is Women's Emphasis Month. However, this message is for everybody. And so we don't have to just apply it just to women. It's for anybody. Just like we are more than conquerors. And there's so many people in this room that have that testimony. Anybody have a testimony of being a conqueror? And not just a conqueror, but more than a conqueror. Knowing that in him, you can do all things. And so this morning, we're going to dig back into the scripture, and I'm going to share a familiar verse to many of you. You may have heard it, and maybe you haven't, and if you've been doing the reading in the, the Bible in a year with us, you probably heard it or read it, but it just kind of went over it. And so we're going to go back, and we're going to dig into the details. Amen? So if you have your Bible app, you can go ahead and open it up. Uh, the sermon notes on our YouVersion app, it's right there. It should be there for you. And then you can share it. Share with other people. Go on Facebook and share and just invite somebody else to watch along with you. Amen. This morning we're talking about what's in a name. What is in a name? And so as many of you, uh, well, my daughter right now is pregnant and uh, she found out the sex of her child early in her pregnancy, and she's been sending out messages, what should I name my child, what should I name my child? And I remember when I was pregnant, I think with all of them, honestly, but uh, we, my husband and I, we would throw out names, you know, some people did different things, you know, name, we, we put a, with a name an association maybe of where you are, or what you want your child to be, or just something that mean something to you. And nowadays, there's so many popular names, and I notice that people are bringing back old names, and some people are, you know, I have a child that, that I, I hadn't heard in a long time, but like I have a lot of Gertrudes and Rubies, and, and I'm really shocked that I was like, you're in kindergarten, Gertrude and Ruby, because <laughs> I always, maybe I saw it as an older person's name, you know, maybe that was your aunt, your grandmother, you know, and you're going, Gertrude, okay, hey Gertrude, you know, and they're sweet as they can be, but, you know, obviously somebody had that name as a child, right? <laughs> but maybe I only knew people who were older with that name, but it's, what's in a name? And so she's been asking around, and she even put it out there on Instagram, what do you think I should have? I mean, fun ones, silly ones, it doesn't matter, give me a name. And I remember when my husband and I, we were having our children, and, you know, um, at that time we didn't have quite the technology where you would know so quick, but I always sensed the sex of my child before I had it. You know, just by the, by the spirit, I knew that what sex I was having. And so we would confirm it with a sonogram. I wouldn't tell anybody, but I would confirm it with a sonogram. And then when I, I had, knew the sex of my child, we would still be playing around with names. And uh, so each of our children, I think when I went into labor, we just looked at each other and said, okay what's this child's name going to be? <laughs> and we were like, and then we would come up, first name, middle name, and then my boys have two middle names, and then we would go, and last name, boom, we knew that. And we would just do it right then while I was in labor, in between pushes, we would go, boom, 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 boom. And that was the final, because, you know, we toyed around names, and we were like, yeah, we think it's going to be, oh, we think it's going to, oh, I like this one, oh, I like that. When we, I, he, we looked at each other, we locked eyes, we were like, okay, Brandon. Michael, Don, bro, boom, you know, and we just knew at that point, you know, it was like, this is it, we got to do it. So with a name, there's so much in a name, right? And so today we're going to look at, you know, in the scripture, uh, names are so important, you know, in the Bible days, uh, the Israelites, they always had an association. Usually there was a name of someone else in the family, so they used names to honor someone, they use names to, um, you know, honor a relative. Usually it was somebody in the family who was honorable. They would, you know, always bring back names, you know. Um, or it had a special meaning. So if they gave a child a name, 
like um, I believe Ichabod means God has departed, you know. And so you, you know, imagine having that name for the rest of your life. You know, God is not with you, you know. So <laughs> that, that's a little hard one, right? But there are some names that were hard to shake. You know, a lot of people, they want to sh- change their name or they're like, oh, my way, you're naming this. But at that time, there was a significant meaning for the name. And so we're going to be looking at um, a name that, boy, if you had this name, you'd be like, okay, mom, what were you thinking? And, and I know my kids, my, my son was, my oldest son, he was like, ah, why didn't you name me Don? I wanted to be Don. And if you know anything about our family, you know why his name is not just Don. <laughs> we had a lot of Dons. So, so he's, he's got Don in there twice, but he was upset that it wasn't Don by the time he got to a certain age. But God, God knows what he's doing. So anyway, we're going to look at 1 Chronicles 4, 9, and 10. And it says, now Jabez. Jabez was more honorable than his brother's. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Wow. And Jabez called on the Lord, on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, and that your hand would be on with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. And so God granted him what he requested. And so we're going to stick here because I know that this is a familiar verse. I I could tell as I started to read it, everybody was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Because back in the 2000s, Bruce Wilkinson uh, created a book just based on this scripture. And it got so popular, over 9 million books were sold. I mean, it became like a movement. There was a devotion, there was a prayer, there was a, I mean, it was journals, it was everything. I, I have one. And so I just, <laughs> it was, I mean, it was like, wow, just pray, da, 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 da. But what I, 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 I went back and I was like, Lord, what do you want to say here in 2022 about Jabez? What was so significant about a name? And so I want to look at how his mother named him. And so let's start looking at his name. And the the scripture says that his mother named him Jabez because I bore him in pain. Now, if you you know anything about Chronicles, Chronicles is a book that um, most people skip over because it is a recap of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Samuel. So you're like, why do I need to read it for the third time? However, the, that, third, that third book, those third set of books, actually give you a different light on the other two. And so if you go back and read it, and we're reading it in our Bible time um, as a church, we've been reading Chronicles. And if you go back, you'll see things put in a different way. And so as I was listening to this, I kept hearing things that I hadn't heard before. And I was like, huh, didn't think about this. But he, she said, I named him because I was in pain. Now, there's just two, chap- two verses. He doesn't have a chapter about him. They didn't give you his genealogy. Besides his genealogy, they were, he was in a list. So just think, they're saying, and these were the sons of, and they just went down the list and called all the people who were before him, his father, his brothers, his father's children, you know, his grandfather's children, just, just this line of names. That's what it was. It was like an honor roll. They just said, and these people were on the honor roll. And, you know, if you've ever gone to a graduation, you go, you know, and it's just a list. And after a while, you stop kind of listening because it's just a list of names. But when you get to these two scriptures, they give him more than a name. They don't even say, and Jabez. They say, now Jabez. Now, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. They don't say what caused her pain. They didn't say if he was a painful childbirth, if it was a painful time in the country. They didn't say if she was going through rejection from her husband. They didn't say 
what was going on. Maybe she lost a parent. Maybe she lost someone significant to her. They didn't say any of that. Nothing is known more about his mother than the fact that she bore him and she said, because you are a pain or you are pain. You caused me pain or whatever. And I'm thinking, you know, I had my, um, when I had my children, I had very large children. And so um, it seemed like each one was getting larger. Well, the first one started out large. My second one got a little smaller. And then my third one, whoa. And so um, I had my, my last one, he was 10 pounds, 10 ounces. Yeah. Where is he? There you go. <laughs> he got his hands up. And look, and the doctor told me he should have stayed in there another week. Wow. Not on my watch. <laughs> So I kind of took things in my own hands with that. I was like, no. So 10 pounds, 10 ounces. And I'm thinking to myself, I could have said, boy, I bore you in pain. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. However, because they were all natural. Yes, people used to ask me. They were all natural. All natural. However, I, I don't know what caused her to... to, to what was she going through? And I think about that because when you look at a scripture, why was that significant? They didn't mention any other parent besides who, birth, who the parents were. They never said anything about any other mother, any other child, nothing. But Jabez gets this whole description because I bore him in pain. And really what that means is that she called him, you're a sorrow maker. Not only are you a sorrow maker, you're going to cause pain wherever you go. And you're going to spread grief and pain for the rest of your lives. Can you imagine carrying that burden as a child? I wonder how that made people treat him. Whenever they called him, your pain, your grief. And then think about the kids on the playground. See, we learned a lot of our life lessons on the playground, you know, just playing outside. You learn how to stand up, you learn how to leadership, you learn how to play games, you learn all kinds of things, you know, how, how to respect other people. You've learned a lot when you played outside, right? And, and, and can you imagine what they said to him and how they called him? And they, you know, guys, people are cruel. They are so cruel. They will find names for you that you, well, they'll call you out of your name, but imagine your name meaning something they don't have to call you out of your name for. You are just pain. And you're going to spread pain. You just bring sorrow wherever you go. What a sad case. Sad, 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 sad case you are. But you are named that by the one that's supposed to love you and care for you. Who knows what she was going through at that time. And so anyway, he says, because I bore him in pain. So let's talk a little bit about pain. You know, um, pain. There are several translations, you know, of this scripture where, where Jabez, it's, it's, it shows how, you know, God will use pain in your life. And this young man, where was he in his life? I think about him and I'm like, can you imagine growing up with that title? Because we put labels and titles on people. And when we put labels and titles on them, a lot of times we're setting a definition of a limit how far they will go, um, you know, they're, we're saying, well, he will go only this far and he'll stop or she'll stop. They'll never be able to go any further than what's put on them. But how many of you know that in God, there is no limit? When you are in Christ, God says, there's no limit, no boundary. I'm the highest. I, I get to say, I have the final say in your life. So it doesn't matter if you missed the first boat. Let's say, you know, some people, maybe they, they went to school and they didn't finish college or they didn't finish um, high school. And, you know, they always live back in regret. But the blessing is you can always go back. You know, you don't have to say that was, that was my fixed position. One of the things that we teach, I, I teach in school and one thing I started teaching my students years ago, I started teaching them about having a growth mindset, that being smart is not a fixed position. Because I think we have, you were taught that we had to be fixed, that either you're smart or you're not, you know? 
So there are people like you're good at math or you're not. And I, I was taught, um, I, I teach, I taught gifted math for a long time, which was funny because I never thought of myself as a math person. But when I went back and took my, got my math degree at um, 30 years after taking math, I was like, oh, I know all of this. It was amazing. I was like, whoa, I guess I was. I, I was good at math, but I just, no one ever told me you're good at math. So I never pursued careers in math and sciences, you know, because no one ever said, hey, girl, you're good at math. You can do this. You're good at science. But I found that I liked those subjects, so I tended to go towards that. And I was like, well, let me stir up this in my children, the children that I teach, you know. And so anyway, I've, I've gone off my point. Let me go back. Um, but uh, yeah, but now I can't remember where I'm going, you know. <laughs> You know how that is, you know, over 50. But I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, limits. So if, if someone had taught me and showed me that, hey, you can do this, and maybe you can apply. See, someone came to me when I was in high school, and I was just going through the motions. I, 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 I really didn't care. I was good at school, but I wasn't. I could have been better, but I just did what I needed to to get by. I just wanted to do what I could. I wasn't like gonna, I, I was gonna get just enough and be happy. And so one of my teachers came to me and she said, you know what, I want to put you in these higher classes. And I was at a school where I was in the minority. And so I didn't know who else was in these classes and I had never been, I didn't really know about those classes. I just didn't know, I knew I wasn't in them. And they were like, you have something great you like literature, and I was really good. But what they didn't know was that the reason I loved literature is because I was studying the Bible in my own time from the age of 14. I would read the scriptures in the um, King James Version, and so I understood the these and the thous. And so when we would get to English Lit, I would excel. And they were like, how do you? I was like, ah. And I didn't understand that there was a correlation. Because I began reading my Bible. I asked for a Bible at 14, and I started reading my Bible every day. And as I read my Bible, I said, Holy Spirit, please show me what this says. Please make this clear to me. Un help me to understand. And so as I did that, I understood literature very well, and I loved to read. And so I thought I was just a great reader, but really what it was was I was actually probably smart in a lot of areas, but no one ever pulled me out. So she pulled me up and said, I want you to read these books over the summer, these classics, to get you ready for the class. When I got in the class, I did really well because I was probably gifted in that area, but we didn't have gifted that I knew of at the time. So what I'm saying is we, we, we have taught children that they're, they are either smart or they're not, but that's not true. There, there were things that will motivate you and push you to certain levels and show other areas of your life if you are exposed or if someone will just introduce you to it. So I have made that my brand that I would always expose kids because there are some gift that may be in them that's hidden dormant that no one will ever know. And so when we put labels on them and say, oh, Johnny can't read or Johnny can't do this, I'm telling you right now, you put something in front of them and you'll see something amazing. Like when I did Legos, you saw something amazing come out of this kid and then that kid was like, can you teach me how to do what I need to do to know how to do this later on, the math, the science, the reading, the whatever, because they were motivated. And so I'm sharing with you about labels and about names. So there was something about Jabez that these two verses were so strong that they stood out, that, that, that not only Bruce Wilkerson, but Charles Spurgeon and other people looked and they said, what is it about this? Why in this whole boring list of honor roll are we saying that? He asked, it says, now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. So did that mean that his brothers were flunk? Like, you know, like, you know, well, you're better than your brothers, you know. No, he would, they were also listed on this honor roll. They were honorable men. But how is it that the one who was named pain, sorrow, pain, and grief became more honorable than his siblings, who were also honorable men. How is that? What, what would bring that out about him? 
the Bible made clear to say, now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And it was like, and then Anna's mother, and it's like, and in spite of the fact, it's like an oxymoron. Like, his name is called grief. His name is called death and destruction, let's say. His name is, but yet he was honorable. And then it goes on to it and said, and then Jabez called. On the name, on the God of Israel, saying, and let's go back before we even get into that, but he called on the name of God. Boy, where was Jabez? What was going on in his life that he would call on God? And what kind of prayer was that? Was it like, oh, God, bless me. God, I need your blessing. Bless my food. God, can, can you bless today? No. I believe that Jabez had had it up enough that there were so many limitations on his life and he was being, have you ever been wrongly accused? Have you ever been taken for something or somebody or not smart or assumed? Have you ever felt you were in a room and people just ignore you or they don't see you? They don't really see your potential. They don't believe in you. They don't care about you. And you know what's inside of you. You know who you are. Something inside of him was fighting. Something inside of him was saying, not me. You keep missing me. You don't know me. You don't see me. You just are looking at me from the outside. You're going at me from my name. So you just assume, you know, he was probably the one. If something happened on the, it's all your fault. Was Jabez there? You know, the pot fell. Was Jabez around? You felt, oh, he was probably like the unlucky charm, you know? You go, oh, Jabez is around. He's, he's unlucky. Can you imagine living with that day in and out? And it's not just coming from out there, but it's in your household, your mother. They never talk if he has a wife. They never said if he had, you know, he, you know, it doesn't, this is just this little thing, this little passage, scriptures. Can you imagine where he was? So I think of this, that what was in his name was something that was, although that name was so, whoo, it was rough. I think about all the different people in the scriptures who, um, well, let, let me go here and then I'll go back to that. But I think about the amount of pain that he must have been in himself. Because when people don't believe you, you're like, I'm an honest person. I don't believe you. If anybody did, it's Jabez. You and when the teacher doesn't believe you, when your parents don't believe you, when your brothers and sisters, no one believes you. And you know in your heart you're an honest person. You know in your heart that you are doing the right thing. You know in your heart you're trying with everything you have. But no one believes you. And you're the one that they say, it's all your fault. And you're the, 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 the butt of all the jokes. It's not only frustrating, it's hurtful. It's, and in that time, you didn't have much further to go, and so it's very limiting. It's almost like a curse. His mom pronounced the curse on him, and everybody was like, yeah, that one. She said he was going to be a problem. She said he was going to be a troublemaker. He, she said... And they all believed it, you know, small town. They all believed it. So he had nowhere to go. I only can imagine the pain that he was in. And I want to share with you, some of us have been through some really painful situations. Some of us have been through some pain that we've caused. Some of us have been in pain because of others. But regardless, it's pain. And there's pain that's good, and there's some pain that's bad. But let me tell you, you know, like, okay, so if you go to a gym, they say, no pain, no. Yeah. Every time I start a new workout, I dread it because I can't sit on the toilet without, like, do enough squats. You're like, why did I restart? Why did I stop? No pain, no gain. They're like, oh, no gain. (laughs) Most of us spend our lives trying to avoid pain. 
when Bruce Wilkinson wrote this book, it was so interesting because everybody was, it was such like a number one bestseller. People started like doing this thing. If I just pray the prayer of Jabez, I will pray it every day. I'll pray at lunch, breakfast. You know, I'm going to pray, God, do this for me. Pray, 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 pray. And so they, they want it. We, we do these things because everybody's looking for the shortcut of pain. No one wants to endure anything. No one wants to go through anything. We want the results you got, but we want to bypass what you did to get there. I want everything that you have, but I want to bypass your story. I want to bypass your suffering, your pain. Can I get it all without that? You know, that microwave stuff. I just want to get your cliff notes. Can I get your cliff notes? Can I get your notes? Can you just share? You do all the reading. You do all the work. But can I get your cliff notes? It's not quite the same. So there's all kinds of pain. But, you know, I want to just remind you that God uses pain to get our attention. He uses pain in our lives to say, hey, I got something better. And so I believe that Jabez was in a lot of pain, and it wasn't of his own doing. Or it could have been of his own doing, but he was like, I'm sick and tired of this pain. Have you ever been sick and tired? If you ever get sick and tired and sick and tired enough, you're going to get in a place where you're not going to accept a little mamby. I just need a little prayer. You're, gonna, you're not going to be like, I just need a little something. Oh, well, you just, you're not going to have that fake stuff. You're not going to be like, well, I just go to church on Sundays because that's just what I do. You're not going to be there where you give God your lip service but not your heart. See, when you hit that pain point, when you hit a place of pain, when you hit a place of hurt, when you hit a place of rejection, you can't just sit there and be an ordinary, um, what is it, Bible belt Christian. You just can't be like, well, this is just what we do. You can't. It has to hit here. It has to hit your heart. When you get there, you will snot, you will cry, you will be on your knees, you'll be on your face, you'll turn down your plate, you'll you'll be like, God, please call on me, God. You will be dramatic with it. You know how people go, it doesn't take all of that. Oh, let me tell you something. If you really want something from God, it takes all of that and more. It will take all of that. Oh, you don't have to be in church every time the door opens. Let me tell you something. If you ever hit that place of pain, you were like, look, I will go 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whatever you need me to do, and I'm going to call on everybody to pray for me. I will be on 6 a.m. prayer, 7.30 prayer, whatever you call, I will be there because I need help. When you hurt enough, you don't care what it costs. You'll be like, what did the doctor say? I'll be there tomorrow. When you hurt enough, if it hurts you, it hurts your child, or it hurts somebody you love, let me tell you, everything else drops. And God uses pain to get our attention. He uses pain to say, I, hey, you, I'm just waiting for you to come to me. When you hurt enough, you'll be back. You'll be back. I'm patient with you. Because I see the plans and purposes I have for you. And you want to do it your way. So let me just, I'll just wait. I'm patient. You know, God doesn't know any day or time, right? So he's got time. All the time in the world. And so he uses pain in our lives to get our attention. So, and most of us don't like pain. Most of us avoid it as fast as we can. So, Jabez, he continues on and he says, Oh, he calls on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. And enlarge my territory and that your hand would be with me. And that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. Now, some scripture says that I may not have pain. 
Well, there's a twofold thing. No, I don't want to be in pain in my life. And none of us want pain. However, I sure don't want to cause pain. Especially if that's the name I was called. I don't want to be anything that's associated with pain. I want to be something different. So here he is in verse 10. He's calling on God. And this, this is why this scripture got so popularized. Is because people are like, oh, that you have blessed me. Finally, there's somebody that says that we can pray for ourselves. That I can be blessed. I can be prosperous. I can have all the things I've ever wanted. Yeah, no. Because there is so much more to his prayer that he would stand out and become honorable. See, getting things and stuff doesn't make you honorable. There are a lot of people who have things and stuff, and they're not honorable. And they don't do honorable things. And they're sure not mentioned in the whole thing that God was giving them the honor. And so he begins to cry out to God. And so let's look at that prayer a little closer. All right, I want to just dig in a little bit. And it says, and he called on him and he says, oh, that you would bless me. And that word bless, it was not just like bless my food. It was more like, God, would you give me that uncompromised, um, the uncommon goodness. Something that only you can give. Something that's supernatural for my life, that you would take my life into a whole nother direction, that you would bless me in a way that would, um, is uncomparable to anyone else. Will you bless me? And yes, he wanted to be blessed, but he wanted a pronouncing of a blessing. See, the only thing that removes a curse is a blessing. And see, he was cursed by his mother, and he needed God to remove the curse and the stain. He needed a blessing, and that's a supernatural blessing. God, bless me indeed. God, do something amazing in my life and make me a person that would honor you. And so he begins to pray this blessing prayer, God, will you bless me? And the thing about it is when he went to God, he was confident he was not like, well, would you, you know, he wasn't like that mealy, like, well, you know, he went with the confidence knowing that he lived the life he was asking God for, that he knew that he was in a relationship with God. It was like, God, me and you have this relationship and no one else sees it. They keep calling me these names. They keep addressing me by that name. However, God, I love you and I want to please you. I want to honor you with my life. I want to be a blessing. God, will you bless me? There was a different humility. See, when you've gone through something and you've been broken, there's a humility on your life like nothing else. You're like, God, whatever. Do it. My life. Do it. I'll, I'll do whatever. You know when you're in trouble and you say, God, if you get me out, I promise I will I promise I'll go to church for the rest of my life. I'm, I promise I'll speak for you. You know, we, how many times have we done that? Yeah. But this man, he really meant it. It wasn't because of just, his, his wasn't a temporary pain. If you get me out, Jesus, today, I'll be better tomorrow. No. His was a life of pain. How do you get out of a life of pain? doesn't say how old he was, but he had a life of pain. And when he had a life of pain, he said, God, will you bless me indeed? And then enlarge my territory. See, he was asking that, he said, will you expand me? Will you expand everything I own and everything I have? Enlarge me. Make me prepared. Sometimes we're asking God for things, and when you ask God for certain things, you've got to be prepared to receive it. We think that, oh, I can just have what you have, but if I haven't walked in your shoes. See, my shoes have prepared me for the life that I'm living. Your shoes are preparing you for the life that you're living, and so it's not that easy. Although we may be the same size, we still have different foot issues, I'll say. And so... 
Jabez was saying, will you bless me? And so the type of blessing he was asking for was a blessing that was not just a little pseudo, like, I just want a blessing. He wanted something that God had to prepare him for. The type of blessing that he was looking for was something that was going to expand not only him, but everything he touched and everything he went around because he wanted to be a blessing. He wanted to bless others in spite of the fact that they said that he was going to bring grief and sorrow. He wanted to reverse that. So he wanted expansion, and God wants to prepare us. And, and when you ask these questions, you have to say, God, will you well, and, and, and God is waiting to see. He's like, will you take the responsibility? Are you willing to go through what it takes? Are you willing to go through what it takes to get that blessing? Are you willing to take the responsibility for that blessing and give me the glory? Are you willing to recognize it's only me? Not me and you, only me. Because the kind of blessing you're asking for, the kind of blessing you want, is not that, that blessing that is like, well, well, me and God. God is not my co-pilot. God is the pilot. You understand? God is the lead. It's the kind that it's like, God, you are first, and I follow you wherever you go. And so Jabez began to cry out to God, oh, God, that you would bless me, expand and enlarge my territory, expand me, and that your hand would be with me. Hey, don't give it to me and leave me, God. I need your hand on my life. And so, Lord, I acknowledge you every day because I can't do this without you. God, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil. You know, it reminds me of when we, were, we read the Lord's Prayer and it says, um, let us not, um, oh, Lord, I haven't read, lead us not into temptation. Thank you. These lights, me and the lights, we just like go blank. But it's like, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Why would he have to say that? Because you know, when you start doing the will of God, there's always something that's coming for, me, for you. So you have to have God's hand of protection on you. Plus, you need the hand of God to bless you so that you can keep the blessing. You don't get it and leave. Okay, thanks, God. That's enough. No. He said that your hand would be with me, that you would walk with me, that you would talk with me, that you would anoint me, that you would prosper me, that you would bless me, that you would stay with me, that you would be in my life, that you would change the course of my life, that you would change the course of my family, that you would change the course of my history, that you would change the generations behind me, that you would bless me, and that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, let me not get into trouble, and then keep me so that evil does not come after me. I don't want to mess up, God, when you give me this. That, that's even worse. God, give me the steps. My husband and I, we prayed when we started in this ministry, started years ago. We were like, God, I don't want the elevator. Don't give me the elevator experience. Give me the steps. And so we've been climbing 40 years. Climbing. I don't want, the, I don't want to go because as easy as I I'm going back down. I want character. I want God's character be built and formed in me. And it was a hard prayer. We didn't know the fullness of it, but it meant that there were some steps. There are some painful steps. There are some painful steps that we didn't want to go through. That would have been a nice elevator experience. Can we zip through this one? But God said, no, you have to go through that. Because then your, his character is formed in you. You become like Christ. In order for us to be the blessing that he has called us, he wants us to be like like Christ, there's something he wants to impart in you. And so prayer supersedes any label, any limitations that are set upon you. When you pray, it changes 
everything. When you pray those God-felt prayers, those heart prayers, God, I need you to deliver me. God, I need you to set me free. God, I know what I've done. Nobody else knows. I know who I am, and I know what I am behind closed doors. God, will you deliver me? God, will you set me free? I need you. I don't want to bring a stain to my family's name. I don't want to dishonor you. I don't want to be named a hypocrite. I don't want to be that person that I see because I see it and it's ugly. God, will you bless me? And then as you bless me, God, will you be with me? And will you keep me from evil? Will you keep me from evil? And he continued to pray this prayer. And he didn't stop. Then he says, that I may not cause pain. God, let me not, let me be faithful to my wife so I don't cause pain. Let me be faithful for, for the example for my children so that they don't cause pain. Whatever it is, let me be a blessing to my mother, even though she felt I caused her pain. Let me be a blessing and honor her. Let me be a blessing to the generations of, around me. Let me be a blessing to my brothers. Will you bless me? God is doing something, and he wants, to, he wants us to ask. He wants us to ask for those blessings. Don't be afraid. A few years back, it's a lot years now, uh, T.D. Jakes came out with a book, and it came, he said, can you stand to be blessed? And everybody's like, yeah, I want the blessing. I want the blessing. I want the blessing. And then he read a little further, and he talked about what it took to get the blessing. Are you willing to, are you willing to do what it takes? To receive the blessing of God. Are you willing to do all? Are you willing to set your heart in a place that you'll be like, Lord, I'll pray even if no one else shows. When we started this church, we were starting in our house and I was pregnant with my daughter. And I remember we had prayer meeting Wednesday night, no matter what. No one showed. It was just us. We prayed faithfully 715 every week. I remember leading worship. And let me tell you, I prayed, I led worship, even when I was, get, I remember getting ready to go in labor. I think I came, went into labor, started labor while in prayer. We were faithful no matter who. We were like 7.15, time to pray. Because we were establishing the habits for where we were going. We were establishing the habits because if I didn't have it then, when no one was around, I wouldn't have it later. It doesn't come when people show up. See, the people aren't going to come and show up if you're not faithful on your knees. And so we started with prayer. So everything we did was bathed in prayer. Everything we said was bathed in prayer. I would send out SOSs. Okay, God, we need help. And God would answer our prayer. But it was because we were added faith in works. We prayed and we worked with God and we said, God, we want this blessing. We want you to do what you said. You told us that we were here to start a church. You told us that we were called. You sent us here from 900 miles away to do something we never saw, to do something we didn't know we were going to do. And God, you, this is your church. Will you do something? Will you bless us? But it came with a, a price. We had to be faithful. We had to be consistent. We had to be diligent. We had to go before God and honor him. And so we went through lots of things to get where we are. See, God's will, it's bigger than your wants. His, big, his will is bigger than your wants. God blesses a God-dependent life. What was so significant about Jabez is that Jabez had a heart for God. A heart like yours, Jesus. He had such a heart. He said, God, bless me. And you know what's so interesting, even with his name? In the scripture, there's a lot of people who had names that meant negative things. When you think about uh, and, uh, Jacob, Jacob's name was trickster or deceiver. And the scripture refers to it. He, he actually, they showed how he did it. He went and stole Esau's birthright. He, he tricked his father to give him the blessing of his brother. He even tricked his father-in-law when he was leaving to get all the, the, the best sheep, right? 
It was character. There was a name because, and in that name, he actually lived it out. And then God said, then he, uh, the Lord sent an angel to meet him on the road. And when he met him on the road, what was interesting is that he had to wrestle. He couldn't just get it. He wrestled with the angel. He said, I need you to bless me. He said, wrestled. And God blessed him and gave him a name change. And he said, now you will be called Israel. Abram, he had some issues with lying. When God got finished with him, he was now Abraham, the father of many nations. Sarai, Sarah. There was a change that took place, and that name signified the change that was taking place, the inner transformation that was taking place in their lives. However, with Jabez, his name was Jabez. And even though he cried out to God and he prayed this prayer, his name never changed. Why? Why? Why didn't God, God please, take my name, <laughs> change my name. It means grief and sorrow. Please change my name. But God chose not to change his name. And I started looking at it and said, why didn't God change your name? Because God needed him to remember that without me, you can do nothing. I need every time they call you, Jabez. You say, but God. Jabez, but God. Jabez, but God. Jabez, but God. See, I would be Jabez without God. Only through God, only through God's hand, only through dependency on God can I live the life that would be changed. That would be different than I was named because I was named and my mother said I was going to cause pain, but that is not who I am. That is not who I'm going to be. I refuse to accept that. See, he had a choice. He had a choice. He could have stayed there and been like, well, that's just the way things are. He could have accepted that. But he refused to accept that. He made a choice and said, not me. And I need something that's bigger than me. I can't change my life, but you can. And so God... Will you change me, God? Will you deliver me, God? Will you bless me, God? Will you heal me, God? Will you, God, do this in me. Your will is bigger than mine. God, I want you to bless me. And he blesses those who are dependent on him. He blesses those that call upon him in earnest. He wants people that said, God, I want your will. I want your purpose. I want to do your will, God. I will bless you. And in that, the Bible says, and so God granted him what he requested. God granted him what he requested. Oh, my God, two verses. In those two verses, you see a man that God blessed indeed. But what was funny in my studying? And I think that says First Chronicles. It's, I mean, it should be First Chronicles. If it says First Corinthians, my apologies. It should be Chronicles because we're in the Old Testament. But let me tell you this. You know what happened with Jabez? And I was like, where is this Jabez from? And where does he go? And how did we get Jabez? And did you know? And I saw this when I was reading the scriptures in the Bible app. I was like, wait, I saw that name before. Well, if you go to... First Chronicles 2, 55, it's this little tiny little part, and it says, and the families of the scribes who dwelt at Jabez, oh, were the Terathites, the Shemathites, Shema, Chantel, help me out, and the Suchathites, these were the Kenites who came from Hamath, the father of the house of Rechab. Let me say this. Do you see that? And the families of the scribes who dwelt at Jabez. 
How's this? There are studies that show that Jabez went on to become a doctor of the law. And not only did he become a doctor of the law, people were so enamored. He was such an honored man and a revered man that scribes from all over began to come to hear and study with Jabez. And not only did God bless him and enlarge his territory, they began to come from all around and they made a town named after Jabez. He said, and who dwelt at Jabez was a place, it was a town, it was a city. Where the scribes, you know, the scribes were the ones who translated the scriptures. They wrote the scriptures. And Jabez had a place. He was so blessed that these scribes had a place to do this in peace. Jabez, Lord, enlarge my territory. And God enlarged him and blessed him in ways that he never, ever intended. He blessed him indeed. And God wants people he can bless indeed, that he can do something supernatural in the earth because that is how he moves. That is how his will gets performed in the earth. He's looking for people that says, Lord, send me. Lord, use me. Lord, I'll go. He's looking for people that says, I will give God all the glory. I will be a blessing because I'm blessed. And I recognize where my blessings come from. Lord, bless me. Bless me indeed. You can stand on your feet. Jesus. Second Chronicles 9. It says this, and it you know, we usually use this scripture in relationship to giving, but it says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You heard that? The harvest of your righteousness. And you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And that your, the end result, your generosity will result in many, 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 many thanksgivings to God. What God wants to do in your life is so much bigger. He wants more people to come back and praise because you said, God, bless me. God, do something in my life. Take off the stench. Take off the stigma of my past. Take off the stench of what I've done before. Take it off, God. Whatever it is, God bless me. And then my, the, my upline, God, maybe they weren't so blessed. But God, that doesn't have to be my story. God bless me so that my upline and my downline are blessed. And I'll do whatever you say. I'll do whatever you say, God. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we stand here like Jabez, Lord, calling on you. Oh, that you would bless us indeed. That we would be prepared for the blessing that you want to put on our lives. And when we receive that, that we'll always give you the honor because your hand is with us. That you'll keep us from evil and you'll deliver us, Lord God, and that you'll cause us not to cause harm to your kingdom. Let us not cause harm to your name. Let us not bring shame on the cross. But oh God, will you do something in us, Lord God, that will be transformational, supernatural. Will you pour your uncommon goodness on us and do something extraordinary. That you, oh God, may glorified and receive many thanksgiving because of our yes. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.